This program contains content that may disturb some viewers, including descriptions of eating disorders. These are some of the art that I've done. Jeez, that one's scary. Yeah, that's kind of like, when I think of the eating disorder, that's kind of the picture that comes to mind for me. It's pretty terrifying. Yeah, it's just feels more like a monster. That's what it's like inside, like a, a monster that's telling you what to do. Yeah. yeah. More than one million Australians have an eating disorder right now. It's one of the deadliest mental illnesses. Do you think Caitlin gave up on herself or she was given up on? She gave up on the system. The system is broken. It's so broken. Cases are exploding and the patients are getting younger. It's as if an alien has come and replaced my daughter. She can turn absolutely demonic. But our health system is appallingly underprepared. Is this a crisis? I think crisis is the only word you can use. Families are begging for help, but they have nowhere to go. This is awful. You've got a young adult who wants treatment, who can't access treatment. Where does this exist in another serious illness? You received the death certificate the other day. A severe and enduring eating disorder, 16 years. And that's how she's remembered it. And that's wrong. I don't know. At Dandenong Hospital in Melbourne, 23-year-old Sarah Ahern has just found out she's being discharged. I feel so defeated and hopeless right now because the aid was so strong. It's her 12th admission in two years. I begged the doctors to let me stay longer, but they won't allow me to. She's spent the past three months in a specialised eating disorder unit. But she's still severely underweight. Okay, Sarah. Sarah has anorexia nervosa. Better than in the hospital, eh? Yeah. Her mum, Jenny, is picking her up with a sense of dread. Sarah's chance of recovery isn't good. It's more than a four-hour journey from Melbourne to their family home outside Swan Hill on the Murray River. I can't see an end to having the eating disorder. I think I went into a hospital feeling a little bit hopeful that I'd get the help and that I'd come home in a better position and that hasn't happened. Sarah hasn't been back here since October. Oh no, where are you? Hello. She hasn't seen you for ages. She missed you. Christmas tree, Sarah. I know. I'll let the Christmas tree for you so you can put it down for me. Yeah. Because you won't need to put it up so you can put it down. Okay, good to be home. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, she must have really missed you if she's coming back this quick. Yeah. Anorexia nervosa is a cruel and torturing illness that's deeply misunderstood. Do you want to get better, Sarah? Yeah. Like, that's all I want and it's the reason that I went in there because I knew that I couldn't do it at home. 
And what's it going to be like this week for you being home finally? I'm pretty anxious about it because I've just got like lots of eating disorder thoughts going on in my head right now. And like, I don't know, I feel like, oh, like now that I'm out of hospital, I can go back to restricting or I can go back to exercising and no one's going to care. Sarah has returned home with almost no support. There aren't any specialised eating disorder services in Swan Hill or the town surrounding it. All she has is her local GP. She's been knocked back twice from the NDIS. Hey, Jenny. Hi, how are you going? Good. It's now up to Jenny to make sure her daughter survives the next few weeks. That's two wheat bix. Yeah, yeah. two wheat bix. And 200 mils of milk. That's oh, enough. That's not yes, enough. it's enough. That's Okay. Yeah. So does that have to be exactly on 200 mils for you? Yeah. Yeah, because if we go over, she'll tip some of it out. Yeah. yeah. So I've got to make sure it's right on, don't we? Yeah. OK. Jenny supervises Sarah during every meal. I need yeah. to sit with her, otherwise she'll have trouble eating her breakfast. If I'm not with her, yeah, she mm -hmm. won't finish it all or won't even start. Is it better to have mum with you when you're eating? Yeah, because otherwise I wouldn't eat. Even in hospital, Sarah struggled to eat the required three meals and three snacks a day. So if the hospital has trouble trying to get her to eat, well, how am I supposed to do it at home? It's a real struggle. Breakfast this morning takes almost an hour. There's obviously something going on in your head that makes it really difficult. What is that? Um. Just all the thoughts that I have that, like, I don't deserve to eat, um, that I'm too fat, that I'm out of control. Yeah. Do you know those thoughts are untrue? Um, not really, like, they feel true to me. Sarah refuses to finish her food. To finish it. That's just all the other stuff. No, that's part of the yoghurt. No. Yeah. No. I know it's hard we have to try and eat the rest. So, eat some more. No, I said no. I know, no, eat some more. No. Sarah becomes visibly distressed after eating. You can see her internal conflict. I know rationally that I need to put on weight, but I'm absolutely terrified and don't want to put on weight at the same time because I feel like I don't need to. Like, I don't see myself as being underweight. What is it that scares you so much about putting on weight? I just feel like my worth as a person will 
go down and people won't love me or care about me. And I just feel really disgusting within myself. Sarah's had anorexia for 10 years now and has found no long-term effective help. She wants to tell her story because few people, even within the health system, seem to really understand her struggle. So many times I've been told to just go eat a burger or go to McDonald's or to not worry about the calories or anything that it is in food. It's just so much more than that. Why isn't it that simple to just eat? If it was just as simple as eating, everyone would be better. No one would be suffering with an eating disorder. Um, like, it's so much more than just the actual food. Like, for me, when I have food, there's so much guilt and shame and anxiety around it. Um, that doesn't just go away if you eat the food. Sarah studied nursing and psychology when she had a brief period of recovery a few years ago. But then she relapsed during COVID. I think her eating disorder is at its worst. She wasn't this bad at the start. What do you think lies ahead? We just don't know what's going to happen. Like, if, it's scary when I go to work too, because I come home thinking, oh, she's going to be collapsed on the floor, or is she going to be OK? Um, that's really scary. So, because she's so unwell, like, that can easily happen. Yeah, so that's hard. It's really hard to go to work and, yeah, and the thing is she could die from it, so, yeah. That's what you're trying to stop. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'll start crying. No, it's OK. Yeah. So it's just step by step then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just go step by step, day by day. Eating disorders were already on the rise before the pandemic hit. Now, numbers have exploded. Some hospitals have recorded an 80 to 100% increase in children with anorexia in the past three years. And the age of patients is getting younger. Hi, Hello. Deanna. How are you? Good, thanks. I'm you Grace. must be great. Yes. Hi. As a mother of seven, you. Deanna Cohen's life has always felt chaotic. How's your morning going? Yeah, hectic, dropping kids yeah. off at school and everything running late as usual. <laughs> now it's nothing short of traumatic. Her daughter Esther has been diagnosed with anorexia nervosa. She's only 11. This is a child who is a particularly gentle, generous, kind, sensitive human being. But when she's terrified about food or if she's, um, if she's stopped from exercising, um, she can turn absolutely demonic. Um, and it's really scary. It's just a side of her that we never saw until she developed an eating disorder. Do you recognise your daughter in those moments? No. No, it's like, it's as, as if an alien has come and replaced my daughter, honestly, at those times. Deanna's daughter has been hospitalised 20 times in 12 months. She says Esther is often held down by security guards while being fed through a tube. The hospital confirmed it only does this to children who are at risk of dying. 
On a physical level, treating it medically, it works. The children gain weight, they gain weight quickly, they stabilise, they're sent home. Psychologically, for Esther, it's been devastating. It's the wrong approach. It's this hard-handed approach and sort of, a, a, you know, almost, almost a punitive approach towards very psychologically unwell children and teenagers. Um, it's, it's damaging. It can make them worse. You are a... Deanna trained as a doctor, but she knew very little about eating disorders until her own child developed one. I thought mothers who are on diets, mothers who comment on their daughter's weight, um, this type of thing is what causes anorexia. Um, perhaps it does in some cases, but certainly in our case, I've never commented on my daughter's weight. I've never been on a diet. Um, we've always encouraged her to eat everything, and yet she developed it at such an incredibly early age. Do you know why or do you suspect why Esther developed an eating disorder? Um, look, there are various factors. I feel like trauma is, is a particular factor in her case. We, we do have a very disabled child in our family um, and that, that's stressful for a family and I think part of that might have contributed. Um, also COVID and being away from her friends for a very long time. <laughs> The reality is anyone can develop an eating disorder. At least four to five percent of the population is estimated to have one right now. It's a serious mental illness that doesn't discriminate by age, gender, postcode or size. I'm Sam Eichen and like more than a million other Australians, I've been affected by an eating disorder. In Hobart, podcast host Sam Eichen has binge eating disorder. It's less deadly than anorexia, but is far more common. I've written about my experience, but it's not something that I like talking about very often because people simply don't believe it exists or they don't believe that someone who looks like me could possibly be affected by it. The 45-year-old is the father of three boys. Bob and Ted, can you guys set the table, please? Great. Mealtimes in this household are relatively stress-free. There we go. But it's what happens in secret that Sam struggles with. Teddy? How do you describe what binge eating disorder is? Uh, I, it's an obsession with food, I think. It's a, it's a compulsion to overeat. Um, and difficult to say what causes it or anything like that, but, yeah, I would say that's the simplest definition. It's a compulsive overeating uh, that doesn't come with the purging or the, the, the restriction. So you're, it, you're still in it at the moment? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's a, a way of coping with stress. It's a release and you think at the time that I'm going to fix this, so I'm going to go and just enjoy this and give myself that hit. And it's just a kind of a mindless hand to mouth kind of a, a process that happens. And um, at the end of it, then you, you then you start, you hit with the shame. Is it hard to tell someone for the first time that this is something you struggle yeah. with? Yeah. Yeah. Hugely. I would prefer to tell someone that I'm addicted to meth. Like, mm. I would prefer to tell somebody that I was an alcoholic or... Um, it's because it's gross. It's a thing people don't like. And there is, in Australian culture, a massive... It's kind of an ick factor. And so in talking about my situation where I'm overweight or obese, that's something that's seen as a huge personal failing. Body positivity is awesome. And Sam has tried to recover many times. He's even been to addiction rehabilitation. Would you wish this upon your best friend? I, that's a really good way of looking at it. Much like anorexia or bulimia, there are still very few treatment options. Advice there for other people in particular. Nobody just has an eating disorder. It co-occurs with, with anxiety or depression or OCD or, um, you know, all, all of these other mental illnesses. So it's a mental illness. It's, and, it, and I don't think just treating the eating disorder is the right approach. Even 
even though more than 1 million Australians have an eating disorder, our health system is appallingly underprepared. There are only 43 dedicated public hospital beds across the country. Some states have none at all. And patients are usually only admitted if they're in a critical condition. There's only one live-in facility in the whole of Australia that solely focuses on helping people recover from eating disorders. Wandi Nerida in the Sunshine Coast hinterland in Queensland takes a different approach. It's run by the Butterfly Foundation, a national charity. But it can cost $73,000 for a 60-day stay here. Hi guys. Hello. I'm Grace. <laughs> hi. <laughs> What's your name? I'm Sophia. Oh, hi. Hello, nice to meet you. Me too. Teacher's aide Sophia checked herself in here for treatment four months ago. Have you got much longer that you're staying? Or? I'm leaving on Monday. OK. Yeah. yeah. Are you excited about that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It'll be good to go home. Yeah. And so what's the sort of daily routine that you have here? It's sort of different every day. So we usually do, like, psychology groups, dietetic groups, and we do yoga and drama mm -hmm. um, and art therapy. Um, exercise physiology. So we do like a mixture of more psychology type groups mm -hmm. um, and then also like more of the creative art stuff, which is really good. Set on a 25 acre block, Wandi looks more like a retreat than a private hospital. But anyone admitted here has been seriously unwell at some stage. Even now, like, my thoughts are in overdrive. It takes a lot of energy. It's long days, long nights, very sleepless nights as well, because you're always thinking about what you can do to compensate or restrict or... It's just never-ending. 28-year-old Shannon was referred here by her psychiatrist but sat on the wait list for almost six months before she finally got in. I've probably spent the last four years in and out of hospital. Um, my eating disorder has been going on since I was 12, though, so it's been a long time. How have you found the hospital system in dealing with eating disorders? I personally found it very traumatic. I have been to a few hospitals in Melbourne, uh, public and private. The public system has unfortunately let me down in many ways. Patients must adhere to a strict daily schedule almost every minute is accounted for. They're under constant surveillance, especially after meal times. Bathrooms are locked to stop behaviours like purging. And if patients miss more than three meals, they can be asked to leave. We're very clear about the expectations and requirements before people come, because to recover from anorexia is like running a marathon. It's really hard work, day in, day out. There's always tears. They are prepared to fly out from... Psychiatrist Warren Ward is Wandi's medical director. Doing well with the psychological tasks. Um, he oversees a specialist team of psychologists, nurses and dietitians. It's very challenging for her. It's a fully recoverable condition, but you can't get better on your own without someone rehabilitating you to do the thing you fear most, eat until your brain comes back. So you say people can make a full recovery? Absolutely, yeah. So I know hundreds of people who've fully recovered. I can think of one person who had 130 admissions. Um, I won't go through all the, the gory details of how, what we had to do to save her life, but it was horrific. And she's now got a degree, she's in a relationship, has a child, hasn't been in hospital for years. Ready 
for your arms. Yeah. How'd you sleep? Pretty good. The reason this place is different is because it doesn't only focus on weight gain. Psychological issues are targeted through different therapies. Actually not bad. Okay, standing. The irony is there are people missing out on getting into Wandi because they're too underweight. Is weight part of the criteria? I'd like to de-emphasise weight. We do have a weight criteria which maybe won't mention because I don't want to trigger viewers at home because anorexia gets very obsessed with numbers, but it's a pretty low weight. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, um, and Why is that part of the criteria, though? Well, I, you could, uh, I think we could run the program with or without it, but the main reason is that at a certain very, 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 very low weight, which is our criteria, people are likely to be medically unstable even if the last test was stable. This is one of the most devastating gaps in the system. Sarah is desperate to get back into Wandi. She was discharged from there after just seven weeks last year. She's been told she needs to gain up to 10 kilograms and prove she's stable to be eligible again. This seems like an almost impossible task. The art books. Yeah. These are some of the art that I've done. What do some of these say? Like worthless, invisible, fat. Just all the thoughts that kind of come into my mind when I look in the mirror. Sometimes Sarah uses art to express how her eating disorder feels for her. Jeez, that one is scary. Yeah, that's kind of like, when I think of the eating disorder, that's kind of the picture that comes to mind for me. It's pretty terrifying. Yeah, it's just, it just feels more like a monster. Yeah. Are they shackles? Yeah, just being tied down and not being able to get out. Is that in hospital or is that the eating disorder? A um, bit of both. Just feeling very trapped. Mm. Yeah. Sarah's experience yeah, through the public hospital busy. system has been traumatic. Yeah. There's been times when I've been told that I'm wasting resources and taking up too much of the nurse's time, that I'm acting like a child. And during those times, it's just me being in a state of really high distress and anxiety and not knowing how to cope with that. Hi, Sarah. Hello, how are you? I'm okay. Sarah's biggest lifeline at the moment is her long-term clinical psychologist, Dr Lindsay Atkins. So are you on the wait list for any more intensive programs? It's all weight dependent. It's either like I need to be physically really, really unwell and then maybe I can get help or I need to be like in a much better place, like there's no in between. Um, yeah. How serious is Sarah's current situation? Yeah, it's serious. She's desperate for help and she needs treatment. Without a treatment team, how are you meant to recover? But what happens if she doesn't get that is, I suppose, what I'm asking. Anyone with a length of illness of over nine years, for example, has a, th a third of cases recovering. So death? Yeah, death is a possibility. Dr Atkins has worked in both public and private health for two decades. She says there's still a significant stigma associated with eating disorders. This is a life-threatening illness and families shouldn't be left scraping together money to try and get into, for example, private services that um, are really expensive and have got significant wait lists. 
at the moment. Basically, no one in Australia should be dying from anorexia. People are dying, though. That's one of the photos um, she started. And it's because the right services aren't there when people need it the most. The girl you see in this photo, this doesn't look like Caitlin towards the end. No, no. Caitlin, the only way I can put it is that she was um, just a skeleton with skin. And that's it. That's all she was. And she knew it, but couldn't stop it. Say Hollow's daughter, Caitlin, died in December. You received... Her death certificate. Yeah, the death certificate the other day. That must have been so hard, getting that in. It actually came yesterday. Oh. Um, what does it say? Of how she passed away. Cause of death. It's severe and enduring eating disorder, 16 years. And that's how she's remembered it. And that's wrong. Oh, no. Sorry, just take your time. In high school, Caitlin was a talented basketball player. When you look back now, why do you think Caitlin developed an eating disorder to begin with? Caitlin was badly bullied at school, very early days. But Caitlin being Caitlin never told anyone. Why was she being bullied, do you she think? She was chubby. She was a chubby little kid. That she was the reason? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, she used to get called all sorts of names. So it started very young then. Yeah. Mm. And behind that lovely little smile of hers was just pain. By the age of 30, Caitlin had been in and out of hospital for half her life. During her latest admission, she decided to stop all treatment. She saw no other way out and she just looked at me and she said, Mum, I'm sorry, but um, I've taken the end of life pathway. And obviously I was like, how does this work? Like, what do you do? And they said, well, she's refused all treatment. So we just keep comfortable. Do you think Caitlin gave up on herself or she was given up on? She gave up on the system. The system is broken. It's so broken. The pathway Caitlin took, that was the only way she could see out. But the pathway I see is that if she had have got more help mentally and tried to do something with the brain prior than, rather than waiting her to starve herself to death. Before she died, Caitlin was part of world-leading research. She gave her DNA to an international study that showed for the first time some people are biologically predisposed to anorexia nervosa. The triggers are clearly complex, but this new evidence could help explain why eating disorders are so hard to treat. At Wandi, a patient called Sophie tells me she thinks genetics has played a role in her eating disorder. I have a really strong history of anorexia in my family. So like on my mum's side, it's quite strong. And so lots of, mem lots of members of my family have the disorder or had the disorder, they've now recovered. So I think growing up, I always knew that that might be something that would eventuate. In a way, is it reassuring to know that there's actually a biological factor to this as well? I think I... I had hoped in a way that it was a bit genetic because I really felt like such a strong inkling from when I was about five, I had my like first like diagnosis. So that's when, um, yeah, like a doctor spoke to my parents about sending me to hospital for disordered eating. So I think it's always been in the back of my mind. The genetic study is unlikely to result in any new treatments anytime soon. Eating disorders receive a tiny fraction of research money per patient compared to other mental illnesses. Hi, Mr. Grace. 
The Federal Health Minister Mark Butler admits the whole system is falling short. Is this a crisis? I think crisis is the only word you can use. I think right through the system, whether it's in primary care, in the hospital system or residential treatment, we clearly need more capacity in the system. That was apparent before the pandemic and it's become even more apparent during the pandemic. But is that something your government can address? There is a budget coming up. Well, ultimately, the allocation of hospital beds is a matter for state governments, but this is something we're trying to work together on. What's your message to the states then? Well, I think state health ministers and state treasurers realise without me having to tell them that this is a very serious pressure on their system and they need to respond to it, but they know that. We've Do you think about... they know that? Well, I'm, I'm confident they know that. We've talked about the pressure on their hospital systems with presentations of under 17 year olds for eating disorders, other mental disorders, suicidality. Uh, they, they, they're well aware of those pressures and I'm confident they'll respond to them. The former government allocated $56 million to build six more residential centres like Wandi in Queensland as part of a national strategy. But none of them are even close to opening. I think it is time that we got some clearer commitments about when those centres would be completed, which is why I've written to health ministers to try to get some clarity around that. What do you say to the mums and dads, though, who have kids who are dying right now of anorexia? They don't have the luxury of time. I can say I, I, I can only imagine your pain. I know how hard you're working to support your child through this incredibly difficult disorder. Uh, we're doing all that we can to put in place better systems with more trained health professionals to support you, but we know we need to do better and we're focused on it. Coming to Wandi, I felt absolutely terrified, but I also knew that I couldn't keep doing things the way I had been. I felt like I was living in a groundhog day, so dependent on routine and structure that I couldn't engage in anything that wasn't inside my eating disorder bubble of safety. It's graduation day at Wandi Narada. I've never been in an environment where I felt so supported, knowing that while recovery is ultimately up to me, every single person here has my back. <laughs> 25-year-old Sophia is leaving after four months of intensive treatment. <laughs> her parents have come up from New South Wales to take her home. <laughs> Sophia isn't fully recovered, but she's come a long way. Oh, so much, you have no idea. I'll just stay. But when she leaves here today, she'll lose her full time support. <laughs> she could relapse. It's now up to Sophia and her parents to keep her on track. One week after Sarah was discharged, she sends me another video diary. She's not doing well. I've lost nearly two kilos in a week and my resting heart rate is in the 50s, which are not good signs. I return to Swan Hill to check in with her. Hello. i give you a little hug. <laughs> how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good. How are you? How are you? Yeah, good, thank you. How are you? I'm OK. That's good. Sounds like you guys have had a bit of a rough week. And are you OK with us being back? I know that it's probably adding to the stress as well. Are you feeling OK with, with that? Yeah, I am. Both Sarah and Jenny are clearly struggling. Last night wasn't good. Like, I just felt so defeated and, like, there was, wasn't any kind of point in trying to get better because I just felt like that 
gap between where I am now and where I need to be to access those programs is so big and it just at the moment feels quite impossible to reach that. We're sort of going backwards already and not going where we want to be. Mm. So there's nothing else I can do. Um, yes. Yeah, we just don't know, we just stop. Being a lot more arguments around food and stuff as well over the past week. It gets hard because I get frustrated as well with her eating disorder. Mm. Um, yeah, and it's not her fault, it's her eating disorder, but it is frustrating when you want her to eat and want her to get better and she can't do it and finding it really, really difficult. Yeah. The hospital hasn't provided Sarah with a meal plan since she left. Did you ring them? Yeah, so she didn't get discharged with the meal plan and then I've rung them and told them I don't have the meal plan um, and I've got to get someone to ring me back, but I haven't heard anything. So it's been almost two weeks. Yeah. You OK, Sarah? Yeah, just have a lot of those thoughts going around. What do you usually do now to help with that? Um, either some like craft or journaling. Keep yourself busy. Yeah. Mm. She wants a more intensive treatment option. She's basically begging for a clinic to take her. So she wants to go to Wandi because yeah. that's really the only place she can go. Yeah, well, that's the place that she feels has helped her the most. And she can't get in. And she can't get in, yeah. And that's the challenge. What are you able to do for her at this point? Look, I think it's advocacy. This is awful. You've got a young adult who wants treatment, who can't access treatment. Like, where, where does this exist in, a, in another serious illness? What does that look like? I guess it's probably the ideal life that I would like to have is just where I can be independent and I can live out of home and, you know, finish my studies and get a job that I love and not have to worry about food and weight and calories and exercise 24 hours a day. Is it possible, do you think? I think it's possible. It's just getting there that's the really hard part.
If this program has raised any concerns, you can contact one of these services.